I asked someone I greatly respect, who in this city has struck you with their incisive intellect and powers of observation? Name me one person. Our next guest is a cultural anthropologist who specializes in media at SFU's School of Interactive Art and Technology. Her Making Culture Lab is exploring multimedia techniques of preserving First Nations and settler culture. Here to share some of her insights, please welcome Kate Hennessy. Thank you so much, Sam, and thank you, Lynn. Um, I'm really honored to be invited to speak. I um, also want to uh, just start by acknowledging that we're on the ancestral territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, and this is a little bit of the, the part of the story that I'm going to tell tonight. I'm going to talk about a project uh, that I'm working on with the artist and the anthropologist Trudy Lynn Smith. Uh, the project I'll talk about was inspired by something that we encountered when we were doing research together a few years ago at the Chicago Field Museum. We had been looking at Northwest Coast pastel drawings that had been collected for the World's Fair in 1893 when we, we came across this imprint of one of the drawings on the inside of the manila folder that had contained it for more than 100 years. We were transfixed. We, we stared at it, we took pictures of it, and we started to wonder what other lively activities uh, and chemical reactions were objects like these initiating in archives against the will of archivists and maybe even the order of the archive itself. While we imagine our museums and our archives to be stable repositories of our uh, histories and of our memories, we also see the force of entropy burning very brightly in these institutions with human caretakers, freezers, and even robots working very hard to keep this deterioration at bay. Trudy and I wondered, could documenting these transformations and telling their stories provide new insight into the archive and its structures? Now, in our work together over the last several years, we've seen how these materials are initiating new forms of association that are quite different from those categories and classifications that archives have used to contain objects. However, at the same time, these transformations can label these objects as anarchival or marked for removal and destruction. Last year, Trudy and I spent time in the Provincial Archive in Victoria. Uh, archivist Anne Tankata and conservation manager Ember Lundgren took us with them through the archives, pointing out things that stood out to them as particularly interesting or remarkable. Anne referred to objects that she was unable to preserve in the archive as fugitives, and for us this was a very intriguing concept. So we set up a photo studio in the archive and we worked with Anne and Ember to document some of these fugitive objects. We started in this process and in talking to them to understand that the anarchival force of molecular transformation, of chemical reactions, and then other human and non-human interactions turn archival materials into fugitives in a number of very intriguing ways. For example, objects become fugitives because they have been exiled. A pile of wallets collects at one end of a shelf in the archive over many years. These most personal of possessions arrive with estates of people like judges or people with no will or relatives to receive them. They have no place in a bureaucratic archive, but they persist on the margins nonetheless in this little, little pile. Disconnected from their archival documentation, they're made fugitives um, by their anarchival status, but also the will of the archivist to keep them as a powerful and intimate reminder of life and death. Fugitives are also anomalies. In 1906, a Gitsen merchant named Simon Gunanute got into a dispute with two settlers at a roadhouse in Hazleton, BC. Later that night, the two men were found shot dead on the trail, and Simon Gunanute and his family went on the run for the next 13 years. So they eventually, uh, he eventually turned himself in and then went on to be exonerated in court here in New Westminster. 
This is a photograph of a bullet cartridge that was found on the trail and was included as evidence in the court proceedings. But this anomalous object is now a physical threat to the integrity of the archive because it could, it's volatile, it could explode. So like Gunanut, it's fugitive. It's outside the order of the colonial archive and it's problematic to preserve within the context of its history. But the bullet for us provides insight into the ways in which humans in the colonial archive make decisions about what is archival, what is anarchival, and then what is fugitive. Fugitives are also mutable because they both become and unbecome fugitive based on how they're valued or devalued by archivists. So this is a box. <laughs> it's containing trap line records uh, that were in the collection of the fish and the wildlife uh, branch of the BC government in Prince George. It contains important correspondence between an Indian agent and the government, um, arguing that Haida trappers had long had established trapping rights in their territory and that the same ter territory should not be handed over to settlers. Now, in the story that Anne Tenkata told us, uh, these records had been deemed anarchival. They were on the loading dock on their way to the dump when an observant person walked by and thought there might be something important there, looked at them, and made them archival again by bringing them to the provincial archive. So these trapline records hold ongoing value for the negotiation of unresolved land and treaty rights in British Columbia. Objects also become fugitive by nature of their inevitable material transformation, so they literally cannot be preserved. This is an image of what happens when nitrate negatives elude preservation storage in freezers. The autocatalytic nature of the cellulose nitrate and acetate means that once the process of deterioration has begun, new properties are generated by this degradation, and then these new properties create further degradation. So the process is unpredictable, it's contagious, and like a prison break, these chemical reactions trigger fugitivity in nearby materials. I'll end with this example of a fugitive 16 millimeter color film in which the colors cyan and blue have faded, leaving only magenta behind. So this is a Soviet film about the life cycle of butterflies and moths made in the 1980s. Um, around the world, color film that was produced with Kodachrome uh, from 1950 through the 80s is collectively turning pink, uh, now united in these archives by color as well as the content. Um, this documentary medium that was once considered stable has turned out to be volatile, although I think quite beautifully so. These magenta films remind us that while there's beauty in material transformation, our current digital practices may not even leave this kind of trace behind when these files are corrupted or obsolete. So will, will your photos last longer than this pink film? I'm not sure. In our work in archives and museums so far, Trudy and I have observed how archivists and curators practice these relational acts of shepherding materials through these constant states of change. There's a tension between the charge of preservation of archival materiality and acknowledgement of the fugitive nature of all things. So in this thinking, archives are not outside of us, nor of the past or for the future. Rather, they run alongside and in relationship with living beings. Entropy is the generative force of things breaking down on their way to becoming other things. What will be remembered and the form that those memories will take may or may not remain to be seen. Thank you. <laughs>